It's really fantastic to be here. I have to say that I have never spoken in a bank or a bank museum before, so this is rather thrilling for me. It's also very it's wonderful to be here in Finland, and I'm very sorry that I'm going to have to speak to you in English, um, but um, everybody I've met speaks very good English, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, my plan is to talk about a number of topics to do with care. Um, they're going to start with sort of more theoretical ones and then build up to more issues to do with policy because I think some of the issues to do with policy about care turn on what's particular about care. Why is it different from everything else that goes on in the economy? Um, so I'm going to start by talking about what we need care for, why it matters, not only to the economy, but to society more generally. Then look at the different ways care is provided, then its specific economic features. And then look more practically into um, changing forms of care provision in Europe. Now, I, Anna, who invited me initially, sent me some notes on what's going on in Finland, but I'm I, this, I'm going to talk more generally about Europe and we can then have a discussion more specifically about Finland. And then um, I, w I really want to make the case for seeing care as investment, so that's what I will end on. So what do we mean by care? Well, I would start by saying who needs care. And they're basically the people who don't have the capabilities to participate fully in society. So different societies might define what you mean by needing care differently. And the definition, this definition I'm using is narrower than some people would use. Some people would say, for example, if you look after your husband, that's a form of care. I would like to restrict it to really people who need that care, who can't, don't, function like other people in society without it. Um, and that's because I think that's more relevant to public policy. <laughs> um, so what I would then say that care consists of are the bodily, hands-on bodily services that help people who have care needs do what other people don't need help to do. So you might think about children need care, need care services. So do some disabled people with disabilities. And a lot of us will need some care services as we get older. Um, but we, do, we can recognize that it may not be that care services aren't the only way to meet care needs. Um, and for example, there may be some technological, um, new technologies, for example, already. Uh, people can get monitored, their health can get monitored sometimes in ways that doesn't involve another person coming to look after you. Um, I said that I thought that norms about care provision, what the idea of what people need varies across societies, but one of the common characteristics is that they're highly gendered in all societies. The idea of who needs care and who provides care is very gendered. And that, that particularly that the norms about care provision are gendered are what many feminists or um, gender theorists in general see as one of the great explanations, the fundamental explanations of why we have such big gender differences in society. But let's go back to the economy. Why does care matter to the economy? Well, one, one reason, at any rate, is that the economy needs people. It needs people as workers and it needs people as consumers. And in order to grow into future workers and consumers, children, at any rate, need care. Um, disabled people, too. Um, older people may be able to stay in the workforce longer with care. Um, and this, this is a slide from the 1970s. Um, it actually focuses on the day-to-day -day replenishment of people, but it captures, it captures well the idea of an economy interdependent with a care system. Now, when people talk about the economy, and particularly when people mention economic growth, they tend to mean what I might call the paid economy, the thing that we measure when we use the term GDP. 
Um, and as I said before, care, one of the things that care does for the economy is it produces the workers and consumers that run it. It's, that is really obvious for childcare, but it's actually also true of the whole care system. And, of course, care uses up resources that the economy might otherwise use. So, in particular, people who are outside the economy because they're, use, they're providing unpaid care, they're, they're, they are resources that could be used by what I call the GDP economy. But also, in, within the GDP economy, provision of paid care is using up resources that could be used elsewhere. But, of course, care doesn't only matter to the economy, it matters to society more broadly. And economic growth is not everything that we care about. I would put it that GDP is just a means to an end, not an end in itself. And we shouldn't get the two confused. Um, if you look at how the national accounts are defined, it's made very clear in that, that the, um, it, was, it was never intended to be a measure of well-being. Um, and even as a measure of of economic output, it misses out quite a lot. It misses out all the unpaid work that is done in the home. Um, and thus, in fact, the majority of care in all societies. So some care is counted in GDP if it's paid care work, but not the majority of care. Um, and of course, other values matter to people other than economic values. And we can see this because the care needs of family members often, for, for many people, take precedence over meeting their own needs or their own interest, economic interests. People who give up work to look after other people or put a lot of effort into it. Um, but also the value of living in a society that looks after its most vulnerable people is also high, highly valued. Um, and good quality care in itself is a public good. It's in itself, in that way at least, a value to more than its direct recipients. Um, so in one way or another, everybody <laughs> thinks that the overarching goal of policy is not actually economic growth, but enhancing well-being, where one might mean that collectively as well as individual. Um, one way, one, there's, there's quite a debate you, you may be aware of going on about what one might mean by well-being. One, one version of that that I rather like because it ties in well with this definition of care is the notion of capabilities, what people can, can be or can do. Um, and that's a measure that's used in various, the, the Human Development Report has, its, um, has a, developed an index based on capability measures, the idea of that what really matters to people is what they can be and what they can do, and material resources are a means to that, they're an important means to that, uh, but they're not, they're not what we should be running society for in itself. So how is care provided? Well, in most societies, by a mixture of four sectors. Um, each, which, each of which has its own logic of how care is provided within it. Um, in this diagram, I've drawn those four sectors. Um, I've drawn the biggest one as the household family, because in all society, even in Sweden, which probably has the most developed paid care sector in the world, still the majority of care is provided unpaid within households. And the other, the other sectors are the community, non-profits, the state, public sector, private, and the private sectors. And economies vary in the relative contribution of those different sectors, and also in the importance of care provision within its sector. It's a rather small part in total of the private sector, but though it's growing in nearly all countries, it's growing in importance within the private sector. But in the, among non-profits, it's quite a large proportion. And of course, it's become a very important part of the house, what goes on in households and families as more and more of other domestic labor has, has diminished and moved into the paid economy. So it, but each does it for different reasons. 
Um, in the household, care is provided to family based members on the basis of need. People think who needs what, and that care is provided. Um, private sector firms produce care if they can do so at a profit. And community non-profit organizations have, their, have aims of their own, and they will provide care if it meets them. Um, it's, of, it's often to do with making up for the, what's missing, what the family and the market is not managing to provide. And of course, the public sector also provides care, and it has its own public policy goals um, that the government will set that it is in meeting by doing so. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what's different about um, care from other goods and services. And in particular, we can see this by recognizing that trends that have gone in production of other goods and services have applied less to care than to some other goods. So in particular, under most, in the production of most goods, you would expect to see rising productivity through the use of machinery or better raw materials that you expect productivity to rise in the production of most goods. You've also seen, particularly over the last 30, 40 years in Europe, a lot of outsourcing of production to lower wage economies. And that has brought, both those things have brought down the prices of many commodities that we buy. But those trends don't apply so much to care. And I'd just like to think about why that is. In many industries, the ones where prices do fall, labor is just an input. It's just one way of producing what, what you're doing. If that's the case, well, you can save labor. Labor-saving techniques would lead to increased productivity. Each person can produce more if we have some way of organizing it better or we use a bit of machinery or whatever. And similarly, if cheaper labor is available elsewhere, you can just outsource it. If you're just thinking about labor as an input not there when you sell the final product, um, then you can outsource and you can increase productivity. And in these industries, industries where you can do that, costs generally rise less fast than wages because you, you, you're increasing, you're, you're substituting other things for labor. Um, but there are some industries, and ones, but Beaumont, the um, economist who made this distinction, said those in which the human touch is crucial Labor isn't just an input, it's also effectively what you are producing. You are producing the person who is there doing the care. Right. Then there's little scope for raising productivity through labor-saving techniques, because in fact you're effectively producing less care if you use less labor. And there's, of course, very little scope for outsourcing to lower-wage economies if you want them there right here. So in those industries costs rise in proportion to wages. Of course, there is, a, there is a form of outsourcing of care that goes on, which is to bring in immigrant labor, and we'll get to that later. But you don't actually move the, the care to other countries. Now, products of this second type of industry become relatively more expensive than the others. The costs of these, these types of industries don't don't fall, the costs of the other types of industries do fall. This is the example Beaumont gave. Beaumont was interested in why in, he was interested in the arts in the US, why whenever um, a theatre got a grant, it was, always, it was never enough. Why did it always run, keep running out of money? And he realized it was because you can't raise productivity so his example was playing a string quartet. The two ways to raise productivity would be to have fewer players or play faster. Neither of them really work. And it's similar with care. You could cut the number of care workers or you could make them deal with, deal with their clients faster. Both of those lead to poor quality care. And this is because care is a hands-on bodily service. So you, that involves building a relationship with, with, between the care worker and their client. So 
it's a prime example of that type of industry in which raising productivity is difficult. And, in fact, labor costs make up nearly all the cost of care. So it's almost impossible to find cheaper ways of doing it. Um, you can't spread a relationship over too many people. And, in fact, of course, you know that staff-client ratios are actually taken as an index of quality. It's a, it, it may not be exactly the same as quality, but it's a very good indicator of the quality of care provision. Um, so, in care, total costs of care rise as fast as wages, and care necessarily becomes more expensive relative to other, costs, other goods. It's a bad, cost, a bad case, if you like, of what Beaumont called his cost disease. And in my view, that's the main reason why governments are obsessed with containing the costs of care, and obsessed with the cutting costs in care. They necessarily are rising relative to the costs of other things, and somehow we've got to get them down. But just before we finish this bit, I just want to say a little bit about skills and pay in care. Because in general, skills about relating to other people tend to be unrecognized. They're often portrayed as the sort of natural attributes of women, rather than being rec recognized as skills that have to be learned and paid for. There was even a report in, not all that good, in the 1990s, so 20 years ago, about the nursing profession in Britain, which seriously went into the discussion of whether being a good nurse was a skill or a natural or just a feminine characteristic. Um, and so we find that paid care tends to be worse paid than other jobs that have similar qualifications or um, need um, similarly skilled people. That's actually true in most countries. It's not true in all countries. It's true in Finland. I looked it up. Um, it isn't true in, in a few countries. So for the same level of qualifications, somebody working in the care sector will tend on average to have lower pay than somebody who's working elsewhere. And of course, that matters at one level. It matters for them, obviously. But it also matters because worse paid workers tend to produce worse quality care. Recognition is important in, in the quality of care. But if productivity can't rise, then costs can only be cut by reducing quality, either through employing less labor or employing cheaper workers. And one way, of course, that is done is to employ more vulnerable workers. And it's one reason why immigrants have been largely been employed across Europe in various sectors of care. Um, and the, the final one is, of course, to employ less well-trained workers. Um, it also means that if you have providers motivated by profit alone, or ones that are squeezed too hard by competition or by cuts in public spending, the only way they can respond to that is to produce lower quality care. So, I now want to go on to what's actually happening in Europe. We've, for some years, we've had most governments produce, promoting a dual earner family. And one of the, at least at the European level, one of the arguments for doing this has, in fact, been to fund a European, the European social model, high spending on a welfare state, through having high levels of labor force participation. And where was the spare labor force to participate, well, it was women, so through having high female um, participation. But the sa those same governments have been continually worried about the rising costs of care provision, even though those women were coming out of providing unpaid care. And at the same time, you've had a growing unwillingness and possibly ability of governments to raise taxes through greater mobility of capital. So we've had a contradictory view. On the one hand, women's employment must be encouraged. On the other hand, spending on care services must be contained. And one approach to that has been the growing marketization of care. 
increasing use of markets to deliver care. So this has been a focus on consumer choice and cost savings. And this is despite, um, despite lower quality being produced. So we're having, for example, shorter on home care, funding of home care, the visits have got shorter and shorter that have been funded. Um, in some cases, the, the decline in quality has been obvious. And the other focus has been on what I could call, invented a word called responsibli responsibilizing individuals and families to make their own provision. So saying it's actually up to you to provide for your own care. It isn't a public good. It isn't a public responsibility. And part of that has been the financial, so, so using financial services to take over functions previously provided by the welfare state. So the welfare state's role has been to shift costs around the, the life course so that, pe so that people can, can be looked after in their old age, but pay into the welfare state when, they, when they're young, and insuring for risks making sure that, that misfortunes that happen to people are picked up publicly. And that's precisely what the fi fi financial services also do. So they, there is a market for financial services in taking over from the welfare state in um, this way. They have, if you, another way to put it is the financial services industry has an interest in... Um, a reduction in the scope of the welfare state. And I would argue that although this has been um, for those countries that have either had austerity imposed upon them or had governments that cho chose to impose austerity, this is simply intensifying a process that has already been going on before the financial crash. So a system of care provision like that depends on, first of all, large amounts of care being provided free by families. Now, I put free in inverted commas because it's actually paid for by the opportunity costs of those unpaid carers. The people who are providing unpaid care therefore cannot do something else. And that's, that's actually what's paying for that care. Um, low quality care being provided by low paid workers available on the market. That's the other side of this system. If you start squeezing costs, that's what you get. Varying amounts of spending on public provision and the finance of care in different countries. And gender norms and roles that make this possible. So women more inclined to take on unpaid caring roles than men. And that's true in most age groups, but it won't necessarily always be true. Women's economic opportunities being remaining more limited than men's, and women's voices being less well heard. Um, in, in particular, little sustained attention being paid to declining quality of care provision. I'd say there's one exception of that. People do seem to be concerned about what's happening to children. It seems to be different with respect to children than adults, but there is, on the whole, extraordinarily little attention played to declining quality. And this may not be sustainable, because what we've got is inequality in the labor market in contributions to care and political voice are currently intertwined. So reinforcing gender norms. For example, they make equal sharing within families difficult. If men, if men earn more than women, it's difficult to, to share care responsibilities. Um, care, it also makes care workers underrepresented and the voices of older care recipients tend to be unheard. This is a sort of self-reinforcing bubble that all these go into. And that slowed down change, but I don't think it's eliminated. We are getting more gender equality in the labour market and to a somewhat lesser extent in the division of unpaid care responsibilities. And we are getting greater recognition of the rights of disabled people and a greater appreciation of the role of the state in social investment. I'll get to that again in a moment. So care is, in fact, becoming a more important political issue. 
the, the last two general elections in my country, in the UK, care of one sort or another figured rather substantially in them, in one case in childcare, in the other case as to how to fund the care of older people. Um, and on top of that, women are becoming a distinct voting block. And it's more and more the case across different countries that you can see a woman's vote, that they don't necessarily vote the same way as men. And of course, old people vote. I haven't moved this. I'm sorry. And of course, old people vote. So I think none of this system that we have at the moment can be taken for granted. And current pressures, I believe, are making such systems unsustainable. So I'd like to propose a different view, that we see care as an investment in social infrastructure. So we consider high-quality care to be an investment. It has benefits that accrue over a period of time, and it has benefits to society as a whole. So we should see it as similar to public expenditure on a bridge. Now, public expenditure on a bridge needs collective funding because it benefits more than its direct users, and it also has benefits that accrue over, an, over time. Expenditure on the bridge comes out of the capital account rather than the current account. So people see that as investment and we see a bridge as infrastructure. But I'd like to argue for seeing care as a different form of infrastructure, a form of social infrastructure. High quality care, and I mean high quality care, I don't mean just any old care now. It benefits more than its direct users. Its direct users will um, have increased productivity that contributes to the economy, and it will also allow unpaid carers to contribute in other ways to the economy and society. The um, And care for adults with disabilities may also increase their productivity. Um, I'm sorry, I've, I've just lost my place for a moment. Um, right, let's start at this. I'll start at the beginning of this. We're, we're talking, first of all, about children. Um, First of all, well cared for children will grow up to be both more productive workers and better citizens, giving us a better economy, a more skilled workforce with fewer days off, and a better society. Um, if you like, the social fabric will be improved and crime reduced and all sorts of things that happen from people being better looked after. And of course, if you look at simply in terms of social expenditure, there will be fewer demands on social services that are required to put things right if those things never went wrong in the first place. So fewer demands on restorative social services. Similarly, care for adults may increase their productivity and then we also have unpaid carers able to contribute in other ways to the economy. So a high quality care sy system is of benefit to all workers and, and citizens. Um, and knowing that they will be well looked after in the future and freed from the need to make potentially inefficient contingency plans and um, not anxious about their own relative's care. As I said before, this de really depends on it being high quality care. Now, why I want to talk about it as an investment is that investment produces a stock whose benefits accrue over time. That's what we mean by an investment. And care services like health, health and education <coughs> contribute to the capabilities of future generations. They increase the stock of human capital. Spending on social infrastructure, that's sort of high quality care, is an investment in the future well-being of society, and it should also improve future productivity. So it should it benefit the GDP economy and save so public expenditure in the long run. So to the extent it does that, public spending on care is an investment. 
Some public spending on care may not be an investment. It may be just for, the, for immediate consumption routes. But a lot of it is an investment, but none of it is counted as such at the moment. It's just seen as current spending. Um, and that causes a direct gender bias in f fiscal policy. It means that employing building workers counts as capital spending, while employing care workers counts as current spending. And if, you, if the government has a different attitude or different fiscal rules about um, capital spending versus current spending, that really matters. So we did a study. This is the group that I come from, the Women's Budget Group um, in the UK. We did a study of the effects of a large public investment, 2% of GDP, either in the care industry, as an example of social infrastructure, or in the construction industry, as a typical focus of stimulus policies, than what one normally thinks of if governments want to stimulate the economy, justified as physical infrastructure. We looked at seven OECD countries. I'm sorry, not Finland in that. Um, and we looked at the direct, indirect, and induced effects. So the darker... Um, this is Within each country, we're spending exactly the same money, either on care or construction. And it's 2% of GDP for each country. The darkest brown there are the direct effects. And you can see that the direct employment effects of investing in care are much larger than construction. And that's because care is a much more labor-intensive industry and is, in many countries, worse paid. It's not in all countries, actually, there. The indirect effects of investment in care are smaller than those of construction, which is what you'd expect because construction uses up a lot of it, materials. The indirect effect, the effects of buying materials. Um, but they're not enough to offset the greater direct effects. So those are the two brown bits. You'll still see they're higher for, if you put them together for care than construction. And then the induced effects. Now, the induced effects are the effects that you get through the workers who've been employed in the care industry and in the industry supplying it, they go out and spend money, and some of that money then will be spent within the economy and result in more employment. And the induced effects of investment in care are also greater than those of investment in construction. And that's because we've got so many more workers employed to start with, and the fact that they're in most countries worse paid, isn't enough to offset their greater numbers. So the total employment effects of investing in care are, in all the countries we look there except Japan, at least half as much again, at least 50% higher from those of investing in construction. And if you looked at the gendered employment effects, so these these. Um, columns here are the same height as the previous one. I've just, instead of dividing them between direct, indirect, and induced effects, I've divided them by the gender of who's employed. That, because all, both those industries are in fact highly gender segregated, investment in care does a, employs far more women, and therefore it reduces the gender employment cap, gap, but investment in construction increases it. Now, if you have um, a law like we do in the UK and a lot of European countries have that suggests that you have to look at the gender, the gendered effects of any government policy, this means that any effect of a government policy to invest in construction has, should be thinking about mitigating measures to, be, to bring in, to, to put back the bad effects on the gender employment gap of investing in construction. You can and one can think of some, like insisting that half the people employed are women. Um, but what you can see is that investing in care has very good gender employment effects. Um, in fact, the whole employment effects are so much greater, the total employment effects are so much greater for investing in care than in construction, that even for men, investing in care does almost as well as investing in construction. Okay, these, these men will not, on the whole, be employed in the care industry, 
um, but they will uh, be employed as a result of that investment in care. Now, I have to say, in doing this analysis, we assumed that everything else stayed the same, so that the um, gender division of labor stayed the same, the, um, and wages stayed the same. In practice, you couldn't do such a large investment in care without changing the conditions in the care industry. We already know that lots of the care industry in many countries has, has great difficulty recruiting because it pays so badly and treats its workers so badly. Um, so in practice, what would happen is that spending that sort of money in care would result in higher wages, probably result in more men going into care too. So this, this, is, this may exaggerate the effects on the gender employment gap, but it would also then have good effects on the gender pay gap. So one way or another does pretty well. Um, so I would argue it's a net gain for the economy as a whole. Um, and one th the other thing to think about, about care, say, versus construction, is that investing in care frees up a whole lot of people to go into the economy. So it is a net gain for the economy as a whole on the supply side as well. So it will expand the economy and, of course, increase tax revenues, the thing that um, European employment policy has been so interested in, and decrease social security spending for those people who, who get care benefit, who get benefits for unpaid care. Now, of course, this isn't true of investment that just gives jobs to existing workers, which might be true of many construction projects. So it has, so care, unlike construction, also has an effect on the supply side. So my conclusion is that so systems of care provision in many parts of Europe are in crisis and they're un unsustainable because they are dependent on outdated care norms. Now, lots of people are saying care systems are un unsustainable and they're usually saying that for demographic reasons. I think they're unsustainable for actually somewhat different reasons. Um, the, d the demographic reasons, I think, can be somewhat exaggerated because it isn't just our increasing life expectancy that leads to care, greater care needs. It's the fact that um, our healthy life expectancy hasn't kept up to our life expectancy so that on the whole people need a bit more care as they get older. But the scale of that isn't quite as great as just saying let's look at increased life expectancy. And secondly, that might not continue to be the case. There are ways, if, if, if we could direct medicine in a different way, if we could care for people better when they're younger so that they have greater, lesser health needs as they get older, we don't need to take that for granted, that an, in, that an aging population is necessarily one that needs more care. The other thing about an aging population is it does also produce more carers. It produces more, very often when people look at dependency ratio, they simply look at people of working age versus people who are above retirement age. And that probably isn't the right ratio to look at. A huge proportion of the people doing, doing unpaid care are people above retirement age. But anyway, I do still think that the system is in crisis. And it's in crisis for a different reason, because of unsustainable gender norms. We just can't assume that the current system will continue anyway. Um, so I would say that we should treat high quality care as an investment in having a better society, in, its, in the social infrastructure we need for a better society. And actually, I would also argue that we actually have to do this. Um, in terms of what really matters in life, the best things in the world aren't, as it was a bumper sticker I saw once in America, the best things in the world aren't things. Okay, so on green grounds, as well as purple grounds, we can't just go on producing more and more things. So what should we do with our time instead? We should be spending them on caring for each other and learning how to do so better. That's it. <laughs>
Um, we will have time for uh, uh, questions and comments later, but um, now um, um, it's time for our first comment speaker, uh, Tuulia Hakola. Uh, she's a senior financial advisor uh, at the Structural Policy Unit at the Ministry of Finance uh, Budget Department. So please welcome Tuulia, the floor is yours. Let's see whether this is on. Yeah. Apologies for not being able to make the PowerPoints as uh, I was a bit busy this morning. Um, so uh, you just have to bear with me talking. I had a, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to give a comment. I had the privilege of seeing the, um, the slides before. So I took about nine points from there. And I have to say, I agree about with half of them. And another half, we might have a discussion. So I'll uh, spend a bit more on those that we have a discussion with. Well, first of all, we heard definitions, what is care, what level of care is needed, and who gives it. And uh, caregiving can vary over time and across societies. Fully agree. That's fine. Tick. Second point, care can reduce GDP because of opportunity costs. And in Finland, we actually have a lot of paid, uh, um, paid benefits for home care. And uh, if you compare that to, it's sort of an opportunity cost as well. If you compare that to, that to the market wage, uh, there might be uh, opportunity cost in, ter in terms of GDP. So fully agree. Welfare is more important than GDP? Yes, indeed. Uh, GDP is an uh, imperfect measure of well-being. It's not really a measure of well-being. It's an indicator of the level of society, but it, doesn't, it does not equal welfare. I don't think anybody, anybody claims that. So I agree with that one as well. Care can be provided by relatives, community, public sector, and private sector, and that affects how the uh, provision of care works. Fully agree with that one as well. Um, then Bormel's disease, so that um, basically that services or care services are harder to outsource or replace by capital. Uh, I agree with that one, even though that's the area where there's a lot of work going on at the moment that uh, trying to find, we call them social innovations, where you can actually save work uh, in a, in a without affecting the quality that the sort of the, the person who receives care feels. Uh, in terms of the quartet, I guess that would be, uh, you can have people carrying their bags, uh, or you can have people organizing the timetable and so forth. Uh, so not, you can't fully replace the human being, but there might be avenues that we have not thought of before. And finally, the point that I, uh, agree with was that uh, thinking of care as an investment. Indeed, uh, care has externalities. Um, so productivity can increase by more than uh, just the direct giving of care to one person. And it has long-term consequences. So if you define investment that way, yes, I agree that you can also define uh, care as investment. But then, I guess we come to the most more interesting part to the discussion. I do not think that investment or spending should have different budget treatment or fiscal policy. I don't think we have that actually in Finland or we have uh, uh, at the EU level. Um, just defining something investment rather than spending. We do get that. I actually work at the budget department. We get a lot of that, and not only in the, in the sort of with um, care, but also infrastructure. Everybody would like to be defined as investment and get more money. I don't think that work, that's the fair way, fair way of working. So in those terms, I don't think it really matters that much whether you consider it investment or spending. Both are important. I mean, that's why we collect funds that you, you spend, in, spend wisely or you invest wisely, regardless of what you call it. 
Uh, second point where I do have a, um, um, let's say, problem with, but where I'd have a discussion is the government obsession with containing costs. I guess obsession to me is a, a bit of a strong wording. We actually uh, have to look into more and more into how we spend money uh, because of aging. And I guess that's why uh, we have a lot more pressure in terms of uh, uh, rising, rising spending pressures. So I guess that comes naturally that you look into aging cost, care cost, where are there social innovations where you could actually save, save in terms of not um, basically having the, the one-to-one -one increase in costs while you're providing more care. Um, then, uh, in terms of whether price and quality are totally opposites, I think that's where one would also marry the, that would marry the discussion in terms of that, yes, we do, in a sense that if we spend more money, we get higher quality, but at the same time, in terms of, say, taking daycare, the, the public good aspect of it is that you think that one person can take care of more than one child. So it's just where, what's sufficient care? I mean, where do you put the level? So um, what's the sufficient quality when it's not everybody on their own? And I guess that's where we have a discussion. Uh, in terms of the, finally, the fiscal stimulus paper, very interesting. Um, I think it's also intuitive in terms of the, uh, the results that uh, the researchers had had in terms of indirect, indirect effects uh, as well as the induced effects now when I understand more how it's done. But then I'd say you have to look or one should look into if you talk of fiscal stimulus that tends to be at least the way we use it it's something where you put more money in but then you reduce it after some time. So it's easier to think of fiscal stimulus in a bridge that once it's built, you need less money to sort of have it and shape after that. But if you say increase the daycare center uh, and most of it is people, so you might not want to reduce it, reduce the people after you take away the stimulus. So that's, that's a tif different type of spending that needs to be thought through. So basically fixed and varying costs can be different. In, in the long run. Also, there was, um, I think in the papers, there was that childcare can finance itself. We actually have made calculations in terms of uh, how much, if we reduce the childcare uh, fees, whether it pays itself or not. And unfortunately, our calculations show that it doesn't. So, uh, depends probably uh, with the level that you have already. And I guess we are now in a welfare society where the sort of quality of care in a lot of respects is already high. So in conclusion, I think uh, uh, it's good to value care. Very interesting, uh, a lot of interesting points. Uh, second point, I don't think for budget treatment of fiscal policy, it matters whether you call it investment or, or spending. Both are important if you do it wisely. Uh, thirdly, I'm not sure, this didn't come earlier, but I'm not sure it's necessarily the best way to enhance equality is to increase caregiving. I think gender equality, actually we are suffering from gender inequality in a lot of respects that we have very segregated labor markets. So I'm not sure increasing care, indus care industry or caregiving would bring us a lot more equality. I think actually I'm not sure it's the reverse, but I think it's a bit of a, 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 a sort of a trip fall that one um, might want to be a bit aware of. And finally, I'm not sure we have a, an equal view on economic growth. I still believe that economic growth can produce sort of well-being, even though it's not one-to-one -one relationship. Thank you. Thank you.